I sat at the bar with my buddy Francis, celebrating what felt like a groundbreaking deal for both our companies. We sealed the agreement with a clink of our beers, taking a triumphant sip. Suddenly, a loud noise erupted from the other end of the bar. What's going on over there? Francis asked, eyes wide with curiosity. No clue, I replied, turning my head towards the commotion. In a booth at the far end, a young blonde woman was surrounded by a group of burly men. She was clearly tipsy, her laughter filling the room as she giggled at something one of the men said. She wore a short skirt and a sleeveless top, and despite the dim lighting, I noticed she had long blonde hair and a rose tattoo on her shoulder. The resemblance to my wife Emily was uncanny, but it couldn't be her. Emily was on one of her business trips, this time in Houston for four days, managing factory operations. Given Emily's frequent travels for her job selling security equipment, I took the opportunity to meet Francis in Oklahoma City without disrupting our family life. As we continued to watch, the blonde woman, whom we dubbed Blundy, got up from her seat and the group began to leave. She walked hand in hand with two men, one black and the other Hispanic. As they passed by us, she locked eyes with me, her dark blue gaze piercing. She gave a fleeting smile before they all burst into laughter and exited the bar. Hey William, you're right. Francis' voice brought me back to reality once the group had departed. I'm William Sutton, head of product development at Riker Industries in Denver, Colorado. I've been negotiating a deal with Francis' company to manufacture a new line of air conditioning controls for energy-efficient smart homes. With a growing concern for the environment, this partnership benefits both our firms. Today's celebration marked the culmination of our hard work. Yeah, I'm fine. I assured him, though my mind was racing. It's just that this woman reminds me so much of Emily. Isn't she supposed to be in Houston? Francis questioned, looking concerned. Yeah, she is, I confirmed, a knot forming in my stomach. But there's something about this blonde that's unsettling, hard to explain. Just then, the waitress approached our table. Two more beers, please, I said, stopping her before she left. But before you go, can you tell me anything about that blonde? Oh, her, she responded cautiously. I've seen her around a few times, always surrounded by a bunch of guys. You don't want to get mixed up with her, do you? I was just curious, I remarked, trying to sound nonchalant. After finishing our beers, we decided to call it a night. I assured Francis we'd stay in touch and headed to my room. Once there, I tried to reach Emily, but each call went straight to voicemail. It struck me as odd since she usually kept her phone close. Growing more anxious, I called the hotel where she was supposed to be staying in Houston, only to be informed she had checked out early that morning. My heart pounded in my chest. Something was definitely wrong. While it wasn't unusual for Emily to manage multiple clients during one trip, she always made sure to inform me of any changes to her travel plans. I sent her a message, typing with an uneasy feeling in my gut. How are you? Everything okay? Her response was swift. I'm tired, she wrote. Long day, getting ready for bed. Where are you? I asked, hoping to catch any hint of deception. At the hotel or else, she replied. My mind raced. What's going on here? Emily had never given me a reason to doubt her, or had she? So I'll be home on Friday evening as planned. See you then. Love you, she added in a follow-up message. Reading between the lines, I sense her usual loving tone masking an unspoken plea. Don't bother me, but I love you more. I responded with a simple, love you too. Confusion consumed me as I returned home the next day. If Emily wasn't at her hotel, then where could she be? Was she even in Houston? Or had she gone somewhere else? I resolved to confront her when I saw her. Friday arrived quickly, and true to her word, Emily made it home before me. Her car was already in the garage. As I ascended the stairs, I heard the shower running. I undressed and decided to join her. When I opened the shower door, she screamed. I moved closer, trying to embrace her, but she recoiled. What's wrong? I asked, feeling a sting of hurt. I haven't seen you in days, and you're acting like I'm some kind of assailant. 
You scared me half to death, she exclaimed, her eyes wide with shock. Please just let me finish my shower, and I'll be out in a few minutes, okay? Understanding her reluctance, I shrugged and exited. It's all right, I assured her. I missed you and just wanted to show you some affection, that's all. Hurriedly, I left the bathroom, dressed, and went downstairs, grabbing a beer and settling in to watch the news. About 25 minutes later, she came down wearing shorts and a t-shirt. I'm sorry for yelling, she apologized. I missed you too. The trip was awful. I tried calling you on Wednesday. Where were you? I was in my hotel room, she insisted. Then why did they say you checked out early that morning? I pressed, suspicion gnawing at me. Oh, I forgot to mention it, she said, looking flustered. There was a bathroom leak and the floor was wet. They couldn't offer me another room, so I switched hotels. I should have informed you. I was worried about you and had good news, I explained, trying to stay calm. Oh, what's that? She asked, forcing a smile. Remember the company in Oklahoma City we were negotiating with? I went there while you were in Houston and closed the deal with the financial director. It's a lucrative opportunity, and if it pans out, we can start thinking about having kids. Were you in Oklahoma City two days ago? She asked, a hint of concern in her voice. Yeah, I was. Why? I responded, feeling a chill run down my spine. You didn't mention going there, she pointed out. It was spur of the moment. Francis was available, so I flew over, spent the night, and came back, I clarified. I thought you were in Houston and would miss me. I tried calling to let you know, but couldn't reach you. Then I called the hotel, and they said you checked out early. I'm sorry, she admitted, looking genuinely remorseful. I should have told you, but I didn't want to bother you. It wouldn't have been a hassle, I reassured her. Hey, I've got news for you too, she announced. My territory's been expanded. I'm taking over for one of the other reps who's leaving. That means I'll be on the road even more. Maybe four or five days a week. Four or five days a week, every week. I exclaimed, my heart sinking. I hardly see you as it is. How long is this going to last? I'm not sure. Until they find someone to replace him. Hopefully within the next three months, she replied. Done. I muttered, feeling the weight of her words. When does this start? I'm flying out to Miami on Monday morning, she revealed. I found out about it last night, when I checked into the office. It's crazy, I sighed. We had dinner, watched TV, then went to bed, where we made love before falling asleep, my mind still swirling with doubts and questions. I wanted to savor every moment with her before she left for Miami, so we went dancing on Saturday night. The night was filled with wild, passionate moments that left us breathless. On Sunday, we slept in and spent the morning intertwined in bed, savoring each other's presence. Eventually, around one o'clock, she got up to start getting ready, and I reluctantly followed suit, heading out to do my usual weekend yard work. That evening, we ordered pizza and ended the day in each other's arms once again. As she prepared to leave for the airport on Monday morning, she kissed me deeply and teasingly ran her hands down the front of my pants. Keep this nice and warm for me, she whispered. Count on it, I replied, trying to sound casual as I kissed her goodbye. She called me every evening from Miami, reassuring me that everything was fine. We spent the weekends making mad, passionate love. This routine went on for about four weeks, and then everything changed. It was Monday morning. I had just taken my first sip of coffee at the office when I remembered Emily had left for New York on Sunday. She mentioned she'd arrived early Monday morning, and that the trip might last at least five days, maybe longer. Though I wasn't thrilled, she assured me it was necessary and beneficial for us. After my second cup of coffee, I returned to my office, only to be struck by a sudden, urgent need to use a restroom. In the men's room, an intense pain shot through me like nothing I'd ever felt before. It was as if my dignity was on fire. Memories of similar symptoms discussed among fellow servicemen flooded back, and a horrible realization dawned on me. Emily had left me with something. 
I informed my secretary that I needed to see a doctor immediately and left the office in a hurry. Dr. Holt, my primary care physician since my Nani days, was quick to see me. After collecting samples and running tests, he returned with a grave expression. I'm sorry, William, but you have gonorrhea, he disclosed. He administered an antibiotic injection and prescribed some pills. Then, with a mix of professionalism and concern, he delved into my recent sexual history. I've only been intimate with one person in the past seven years. My wife, Emily, I told him. We've been married for five years, and before that, she was my only partner. He looked at me with a sorrowful expression. I understand, he said. She needs to see a doctor urgently. He handed me a piece of paper with instructions and emphasized no sexual activity for two weeks. No problem there, I assured him, feeling a wave of anger and betrayal. There was no way I was going to be intimate with Emily again anytime soon. After settling the bill, I made my way to the car and called my boss, giving him a brief update. He empathized with my situation and granted me a few days off to handle things. Consumed by the need to unravel what my wife was up to and with whom, I decided to reach out to a private investigator. Lang Investigations, how may I assist you? Greeted a friendly female voice when I called. I introduced myself and requested a meeting. The receptionist informed me I could meet with the investigator immediately. I agreed and arrived at their office. Located in a charming business park near a doctor's office, I half expected a dimly lit smoky room, but was pleasantly surprised by the well-appointed space. The receptionist greeted me with a warm smile. Mr. Lang is expecting you. Please follow me, she said. As she walked, I couldn't help but notice her grace and poise. She knocked on the door and ushered me inside. A burly man rose from his seat and extended his hand. Magnus Lang, he introduced himself. Please take a seat. Can I offer you a drink? Coffee tea? No, I'm good, thanks, I declined. Once the receptionist exited, Magnus turned to me with a focused look. What can I do for you today, Mr. Sutton? He inquired, attentively taking notes as I recounted the situation. Have you consulted with a lawyer yet? He asked. Not yet, I replied. Well, we collaborate with several lawyers in the area, he mentioned. I can recommend one if you'd like. That would be helpful. Thank you, I accepted. Your wife is in New York? He queried. I nodded. Is she traveling elsewhere this week? I don't know, I admitted. She hasn't mentioned any other plans. I can call her office and find out, he offered. Or why don't you do it? He handed me the phone. Nervously, I dialed her office number, the dread of what I might discover tightening in my chest. After a few rings, a secretary, Alison Poole, answered. I requested to speak with my wife's assistant, Daniela Holder. Soon, Daniela was on the line. Hi, Daniela. It's William Sutton. Could you provide me with some details about my wife's schedule? I inquired. Usually, she leaves it with me before her trips, but I seem to have misplaced it. I'm sorry, Mr. Sutton, but Mrs. Sutton doesn't work here anymore, Daniela disclosed. Didn't she tell you? I asked, bewildered. Tell me what? She resigned about a month ago, Daniela clarified. I felt my heart sink. I'm surprised she didn't mention anything about leaving, I remarked. Did she explain why she's quitting? Something about the chance to earn more money doing what she loves, Daniela informed me. Did she disclose the name of her new employer? I inquired, my voice shaking slightly. No, she didn't share that, Daniela replied. I'm sorry, Mr. Sutton but I don't have any further information for you. It's all right, Daniela. I reassured her, trying to mask my growing panic. Thank you anyway. After wrapping up the conversation, I relayed the details to Magnus. Interesting, he commented, raising an eyebrow. Suddenly, it struck me. I had installed a phone tracking app on her phone a few months back after she misplaced it during a prior trip. Fortunately, it was found and returned by hotel staff before she flew home. When she returned, I installed the app again as a precaution. Opening the app, I awaited the location report of her phone. According to the app, 
her phone was registered at the Courtyard New York Manhattan Hotel. Yet, she had told me she was staying at the Times Square Hotel. Why was she at a different hotel? I shared this information with Magnus, who took note of it. Then, a memory resurfaced, the night I spent with Francis. What if she's disguising herself? I pondered. Could your team track her then? I asked, desperation creeping into my voice. We have methods for such scenarios, Magnus assured me. Do you think she's capable of changing her appearance? I recounted the encounter with the woman I saw that night with Francis. After a brief pause, Magnus replied, This seems more complex than a typical infidelity case. Your wife is evidently concealing something from you, Mr. Sutton, and she's gone to great lengths to keep you in the dark. I do have associates in New York and other cities who occasionally assist me, he explained. Involving them will incur additional costs. I need to uncover what she's up to, I insisted. Please connect them to this. Sending Magnus some pictures of Emily, I awaited his response. He acknowledged receiving the photos before passing me paperwork to complete. I'll attend to it promptly, he assured me. I'll oversee her activities in New York. It may take a few days, but I'll get to the bottom of it. I'll contact you once I have a report ready. Handing me a business card bearing the name Harry Davidson Lawyer, he advised, she's the sharpest legal mind around. Sharks avoid her path. If you catch my drift, I suggest contacting her immediately. Feel free to mention our discussion. I'll ensure she receives a full copy of my findings. Thank you. I appreciate it. I acknowledged. Concluding our meeting, we rose and shook hands. I left the documents with the secretary, providing a substantial deposit. Exciting the office, I retrieved Magnus' business card and placed a call. Though Harry was unavailable, I secured an appointment for 8 a.m. on Wednesday. Satisfied, I headed home. Contemplating whether to contact or message Emily, I opted against it. Historically, she would call me once she finished her daily tasks. I decided to maintain the charade, allowing her to believe I was unaware of the situation. However, I resolved to peruse her documents, securely stashed in her desk drawer. The lock on her desk was fitted with two keys mirroring mine. She had one key, and I possessed the other, much like she had access to my desk. Previously, invading her privacy wouldn't have crossed my mind. But that was before she deceived and betrayed my trust. As I opened the drawer and surveyed the meticulously arranged folders within, I couldn't help but appreciate Emily's organizational skills, an aspect I typically valued. I began my search and came across a thick folder brimming with bank statements from an unfamiliar bank. Recollection struck. She had maintained a separate account since our marriage. I assumed she closed it when we established a joint account shortly after tying the knot, but evidently she hadn't. Some statements dated back at least a year before our marriage. The latest, dated just over three weeks ago, displayed a balance exceeding $400,000. What's going on here? I wondered aloud. Examining the statements, I noticed sizable deposits from a company called Brust Enterprises, unfamiliar to me. I made a mental note to investigate further. Additionally, there were withdrawals for lavish items like high-end clothing, jewelry, wigs, hotel stays, and plane tickets. One ticket was for a round-trip flight from Houston to Oklahoma City, purchased just days before my meeting with Francis. Could it be? Was the woman I glimpsed at the bar posing as Emily? Digging deeper, I unearthed three payments to planned parenthood clinics. My head spun as I tried to make sense of it all. Each revelation added another layer to the mystery of who my wife really was and what she had been hiding from me. The initial payment occurred roughly a year post-marriage, followed by two subsequent ones at intervals of one and two years thereafter. Desiring clarity, I delved further, uncovering a folder containing receipts and statements from various medical professionals and clinics. At the top lay a receipt from the doctor she had visited just before her recent trip. According to the records, she had undergone examination and treatment for gonorrhea. Furthermore, I stumbled upon three receipts from different clinics for D&C procedures. I didn't need further investigation to understand. Since our marriage, she had undergone at least three feticides without informing me 
not even disclosing her pregnancies. It felt like a blow to the gut. But that wasn't all. A folder packed with tax forms from three years back caught my eye. Emily had insisted we file separate tax forms, citing concerns about her bonuses and commissions potentially elevating our tax bracket. Though we debated this, I eventually acquiesced. Now the truth behind her insistence became clear. Besides her disclosure, hinting that she earned significantly more than she divulged, I discovered transfers from Brust Enterprises. The latest transaction indicated a substantial sum deposited into her account. However, the purpose remained unclear. Another folder yielded crucial information. Signed consent forms and a contract between Emily and Brust Enterprises. While I didn't grasp all the legal jargon, I gleaned the essence of the document. It appeared Emily had agreed to star in at least five adult films annually for five years. The contract, notarized and dated over three years ago, bore signatures from both Emily and Harold Brust, Brust Enterprises' president and CEO. Copying the folders, I assembled the documents into a new folder intended for the lawyer. I scanned the most damning papers into a PDF file and saved it onto a flash drive. My plan was to email them to Magnus. After returning everything to her drawer and securing it, I felt I had amassed sufficient evidence. Yet, I craved context. Had she been unfaithful throughout our marriage? And where did this influx of money originate? Lacking access to her emails or texts, I found myself at a disadvantage. Sending the files to Magnus via email, I phoned him to inform him of the update. He expressed gratitude and promised to examine the information further. Moving to our master bedroom, I navigated to her dressing room. Normally, I respected her privacy, but I decided to explore her closet. Amidst several bags of revealing attire more suited for nightclubs, I discovered a couple of wigs, one resembling the one I saw in Oklahoma City. In addition, I found a stack of plastic drawers containing various items. Among them were small boxes holding cosmetic contact lenses. Although Emily didn't typically wear glasses or lenses, these were purely cosmetic, altering eye color. I stumbled upon a small booklet that seemed to hold temporary tattoos. One of them resembled the rose I spotted on a woman in Oklahoma. Dan, I pondered. How deep is Emily willing to go to deceive me? Who is this woman I've married? Continuing my search, I came across a box tucked away in a corner, housing an array of pleasure toys. Once, I expressed a desire to witness her use such toys, but she rejected the idea, deeming it perverse. At the box bottom, I discovered a DVD in a plastic case labelled Boys Volume 1 in black marker. What in the world? I muttered. Heading downstairs, I inserted the DVD into the player and switched on the TV. The screen revealed a dimly lit room with a narrow, upholstered bench. A date stamp in the lower right corner indicated the video was captured about three years prior. Interesting, I mused to myself. As the bench bathed in bright light, Emily approached, donning a short sundress and a long red wig, presumably to conceal her identity. In the background, a rough male voice instructed her to disrobe. You arrive on time. Good. Now undress, the voice commanded. Yes, sir. Emily replied softly, nodding. She unbuttoned her dress, slipped the straps off her shoulders, and let the garment fall to the floor, revealing her undressedness. A towel-clad man approached and scrutinized her, as if she were a commodity. I see you're married, he remarked, lifting her left hand to reveal the rings I placed on her finger when we married. Yes, sir, I'm married, she affirmed. The man inquired further. Does your husband know what you do? Emily replied. He knows. The man pressed on. Is he okay with this? Emily nodded and replied. Yes, sir, he's fine. He knows he can never satisfy me, so he said I could go and find someone to satisfy me carnally. Shocked, I exclaimed at the TV. What? I never said anything like that. Then it occurred to me that perhaps this was the narrative she was expected to uphold. Subsequently, scenes unfolded featuring Emily engaged in carnal acts with multiple men. I observed that none of them used protection. 
It's no wonder she caught gonorrhea, I thought, pondering what else she might reveal. Shocked with Bielander's statement. I was devastated. I cried, screamed, and screamed. How could she do this to me, to us? In that moment, I realized all the love I felt for her had vanished, replaced by burning hatred. I wanted her out of my life forever. Needing an escape, I cleaned up and headed to Hikers, a bar and grill I frequented. Ordering a beer and a burger, I sat pondering what had gone wrong in my marriage. I racked my brain trying to discern what I had done to drive Emily to such actions. I'd always treated her with kindness and respect, showering her with love from the moment we met. I often surprised her with flowers or cards to express my love. I believe we had a fulfilling bed life. I certainly was satisfied and she appeared content too. I never even entertained the thought of cheating on her. I would never betray her trust like that. So why is she doing this? I wondered, feeling a mix of anguish and confusion. Finishing my burger, I glanced at the time. It was four o'clock. I had an idea and dialed Harry Davidson's office. With what I had uncovered, I knew I couldn't wait any longer to initiate the divorce proceedings. After listening to the secretary's spiel, I made my request. Well, let me check, Mr. Sutton, she responded. It appears there's been a cancellation and Ms. Davidson is available tomorrow at 8 a.m. Would that work for you? Absolutely, I affirmed. Very well. I'll reschedule your appointment right away and she'll see you first thing in the morning. Thank you. I expressed my gratitude. See you then. It brought some relief. Shortly after this call, my phone rang. It was Emily. Debating whether to answer, I ultimately picked up. Yes, I greeted her curtly. A uh, William, it's me, Emily. She sounded taken aback by my tone. Are you okay? Not really. Emily, I confessed. I've had a rough day. How are you? It's a bit early, isn't it? She remarked. Well, it's not too early, she countered. You know, I'm in New York. I just wanted to let you know that I'm heading out for dinner, and then I'll be busy with clients tonight. Thanks for the update, I acknowledged. How's everything going for you? Pretty good, actually, she reported. The deal we're working on looks promising for our bottom line. That's good, I responded. William, are you sure you're okay? She sounded concerned. You don't see yourself. I'm just not feeling well at the moment, I admitted. Sorry, is there anything I can do, she offered. No, there's nothing you can do, I replied. I'll probably turn in early. Maybe I'll see someone if I still feel bad tomorrow. Take care of yourself, she urged. I want you to be in good health when I return. You know I miss you. Yes, I acknowledged. I love you, she expressed. Me too, I responded before ending the call. I wondered if she noticed my omission of the words, I love you, in return, but I didn't really care about her feelings toward me anymore. I finished my burger and returned home, where I lounged on the couch and watched TV until I drifted off to sleep. The following morning, I woke up early, brewed coffee, showered, dressed, and gathered all the necessary documents to meet with Harry. Arriving a few minutes before eight, I was promptly ushered inside. Harry rose from her seat and shook my hand. Good morning, Mr. Sutton, she greeted me. What can we assist you with today, she inquired. Mr. Sutton, she greeted me. What can we assist you with today, she inquired. I recounted all the information I had and placed a bulky folder on her desk containing the evidence I had amassed thus far. Harry carefully examined the contents, her eyes widening as she reviewed the documents. After perusing everything, she set the folder down and turned her attention to me. I assume you've already spoken to Mr. Lam, she asked. That's correct, I affirmed, and I've provided him with some of this information. He mentioned that he has colleagues in New York who will oversee her there. Understood, she acknowledged. What are your objectives in this matter? Simply put, I replied, I want her out of my life. I aim to retain my home, pension, income, and all assets. As far as I'm aware, she stands to gain half a million from her accounts, pension, and personal property. I'm not inclined to provide any financial support. Judging from the financials, it appears she earned considerably more than you, Ari observed. However, 
I don't foresee significant issues with spousal support. The court may compel you to sell the house and allocate half the proceeds along with a portion of joint assets to her, but I'll endeavor to minimize this. Fortunately, in this state, you can pursue legal action based on infidelity, which most judges consider when dividing assets. I'll consult with Magnus, assess the evidence, and devise a strategy upon her return Sunday afternoon, I informed her. Excellent, she remarked. This will afford me sufficient time to compile everything and initiate legal proceedings. She handed me her business card, having inscribed her personal cell phone number on the back. Additionally, she gave me a sheet of instructions. If anything arises, don't hesitate to reach out. Avoid rush decisions. I'll contact you once the documents are prepared for submission. Reach out. Avoid rush decisions. I'll contact you once the documents are prepared for submission. Thank you. I express my gratitude. She smiled, signaling the conclusion of our meeting. We shook hands, and I exited the office, pausing at the secretary's desk to settle the advance. The following two days passed uneventfully. My routine remained unchanged. Wake up. Work. Return home. Eat. Sleep. Although my boss offered me time off, I felt restless and preferred to stay active rather than idling at home. On Thursday afternoon, Harry called and requested a meeting with Magnus and her at her office the next morning. I agreed and informed my boss, who granted me Friday off. Later that evening, Emily phoned me. I just wanted to inform you that everything is proceeding as planned, and I'll be back home on Sunday afternoon, she stated. That's reassuring, I replied. What time do you expect to arrive? I'll catch a taxi from the airport and should be home around once, she informed me. Then we can celebrate. Are you excited? Yes, absolutely, I affirmed. All right, Annie, she said. See you then. Hope you've been taking your vitamins. I plan to tire you out with our lovemaking. I chuckled in response. Sounds enticing, I remarked. See you then. We concluded the call, and I reclined in my chair with a grin. Someone's in for a surprise, I thought to myself. The following day, I arrived at Harry's office a few minutes early and was promptly ushered into a conference room. I exchanged handshakes with Magnus and Harry and was introduced to two imposing men in dark suits. William, meet Agent Smith and Special Agent Peter from the FBI, Harry said. FBI, I exclaimed. Why are they involved? We'll address that shortly, Harry replied. Please, let's take a seat and discuss. As we settled down, Harry produced the divorce papers. These were filed in court yesterday afternoon as per your request, she informed me. You mentioned your wife's expected return tomorrow at 1 p.m., correct? Yes, that's correct, I confirmed. All right, she continued, passing the papers to Magnus. Magnus will deliver these to her. He's also a notary, so he can attest her signature if she signs. I believe she'll comply once she comprehends her predicament. Magnus opened his briefcase, stowed away the papers, then retrieved a thick folder and a stack of DVDs, placing them on the table. What's all this about? I inquired. This is my final report, Magnus stated. He passed me a photo of a rather disheveled looking man with slicked back hair. Who's this? I inquired. He seems pretty sketchy. Magnus chuckled. That's Harold Brust. He replied, and your spot on about him being creepy is the head honcho of the national chain of strip clubs based in Richmond, Virginia Plus. He's heavily involved in the adult film biz, quite the character. If you ask me a few years back, he's heavily involved in the adult film biz. Quite the character, if you ask me. A few years back, he made a failed bid for Congress and caused quite a ruckus on social media with his wild rants. About five years ago, he started up an exclusive men's club. Entry was easy, just fork over $3,000 and meet the physical requirements. What do you mean by physical requirements? I probed. They've got to be well endowed, Magnus clarified. At least nine inches, you mean? I speculated. Yep, that's the one. Magnus confirmed, preempting my question. This club's got branches all over the country. They gather once or twice a month for wild parties, sometimes recruiting local girls. So my wife was one of them, I surmised. Yep, she's been at it for at least five years, Magnus confirmed. Dan, I muttered. 
But how did she manage this during her work trips? Magnus elucidated. From what we've gathered, she's been shortening her trips by a day or two. She joined the event. Then she needed a day or two to, um, compose herself and regain her bearings. She figured that within a couple of days, she'd be back to her usual self, hoping you wouldn't notice any changes, Magnus recounted. This deceitful woman, I silently seethed. All this time, I had no clue what was going on. She went to great lengths to keep her double life hidden from you, Magnus continued. She frequently disguised herself with wigs, temporary tattoos, and colored contact lenses to alter her appearance. Knowing you respected her privacy, she stashed away her tools of deception in her closet and desk drawer. I reflected, recalling the items I discovered. But Magnus had more to reveal. About three years back, Bruss saw an opportunity to profit further by filling the monthly group activities for sale. Participants received a portion of the earnings, he disclosed. Your wife agreed to take part, signing an open-ended contract committing to five videos per year. So far, she's directed 13 films for Brust. He concluded, gesturing toward a stack of DVDs. Brust uploaded excerpts, ranging from 7 to 15 minutes of these videos as promotions on various adult websites. Magnus disclosed, Currently, these clips have garnered hundreds of thousands of views and downloads. Your wife's talents are widely recognized now, but that's not the end of it. About a month ago, Brust hired your wife on a full-time basis. Apart from performing, she's been assigned the role of recruiting and training other women to follow in her footsteps, Magnus elaborated. I sat there, stunned, processing Magnus' revelations. So, why is the FBI involved? I inquired. Special Agent Peter chimed in. Remember that physical involvement cult case involving a local actress a few years back? Peter queried. Yes, I vaguely recall hearing about it, I acknowledged. As far as I recall, the ringleader received a hefty prison sentence for that, I recollected. Indeed, he was sentenced to 110 years, Peter confirmed. We suspect a similar scenario with your wife and Brust. We can't divulge all the details presently, but we'll need to apprehend your wife. Your cooperation would be greatly appreciated. Naturally, I'll do whatever I can to assist, I assured them. If Emily's involved in something like this, I won't just stand idly by. What's the plan? We deliberated strategy for about an hour. I listened as Smith and Peter outlined their approach, and the rest of us offered input. Eventually, we settled on a course of action. All right, Mr. Sutton, Peter stated as he stood up. I'll see you on Sunday. Sounds intriguing. Agent Peter, I replied, shaking his hand. We bid farewell and I watched them depart. I'm truly sorry about all of this, William, Harry expressed. I have to admit, this situation is quite extraordinary. I've never encountered anything like it. It's hard to believe she deceived me for so long, I remarked. I feel like a complete fool. Harry retrieved a business card from her briefcase and handed it to me. William, I think once this is all resolved, you should really consider speaking to someone, she suggested. This consultant, in my opinion, is the best in the business. I strongly advise you to give her a call. I glanced at the card, noting the name Dr. Matthew Nelson. I'll contact her as soon as I get home, I promised. Good idea, she concurred. I shook her hand, gathered the materials Magnus had provided, and headed home. Upon arrival, I phoned Dr. Nelson and arranged to meet her the following Wednesday. Then I proceeded with the tasks we had discussed in Harry's office. Sunday, William and Emily Sutton's residence. Shortly after four, the door opened and Emily entered, carrying a suitcase, a briefcase, a rolling duffel bag, and a large garnet bag. She laid everything out on the sofa and smiled at me. However, a smile faded as she noticed the items arranged on the kitchen table in front of me. Sit down, Emily, I stated calmly. We need to talk. Um, I really need to go take a shower and clean everything up first, she replied. We can wait. No, Emily, I asserted firmly. We need to talk now. But I said, sit down, woman, I exclaimed. She flinched at my outburst. I had never raised my voice to her like that in all the years we've been together. Slowly, she approached the kitchen table, 
eyeing everything I had laid out. She pulled out a chair and sat down. What does all of this mean? she inquired. I ignored her question. Tell me something, Emily. I pressed. It was you I saw in Oklahoma City the week you claimed to be in Houston, wasn't it? The shocked expression on her face shifted, and Emily, who sat before me, transformed into someone unrecognizable. Yes, it was me, she admitted calmly. I was surprised to see you there and half expected you to do something. It's a good thing you didn't. Those you there and half expected you to do something. It's a good thing you didn't. Those guys would have stomped you into the ground. By the way, how did you recognize me? You can dress up any way you want, Emily, but no matter what you do, it won't change your face. I would recognize you anywhere, I informed her. So were you ever going to tell me about the three feticides you had? Actually, there were four feticides, she corrected. The first one was a couple of months before we got married. Were any of these children mine? I queried. Maybe, she responded. Maybe. I don't know. I've had physical involvement with a lot of guys, including black or Latino guys. I didn't want to risk giving you a child who was clearly biracial. Besides, I really didn't want to be burdened with a child. In the end, it's my choice. Yes, I agree that it's your choice, I acknowledged. But it's also my choice to never want to touch you again. How long has this crap been going on? I know it's been at least five years. This went on even before we got engaged, she admitted. At first it was maybe once every two months or so. Then it became a monthly event. Eventually, I would do this every time I was out of town. At first I arranged all this myself. Then I met Harry Brust and everything changed. Why? I asked, shaking my head. It's simple, she explained. I like physical involvement a lot, and I like it when several men have me at once. Don't get me wrong, you are a great husband and a wonderful lover. You always drove me crazy, but there was also a difference. You made love to me. They just made this with me again and again and again. That's all that happened, just physical involvement. It had nothing to do with you and it never changed how I felt about you. I loved you. I still love you. I've never turned you down and nothing I've done has ever hurt you. So now that you know, there's no point in hiding it. You're a stupid fool, I said. You think nothing you did hurt me. Really? You freaking gave me gonorrhea. You stupid cow. Did you tell them you have physical involvement with me, or did you lie about that too? I really regret it, she admitted. I thought that as soon as I got my chance, everything would be fine. And no, I did not include you in my list of carnal partners. Engaging amazing. No wonder I didn't get any warning. Well, obviously you weren't. All right, I said. How long did you plan to continue doing this crap? I don't know, she shrugged. Maybe several years. I decided that once I save up a few million, I could retire and then we could go on a cruise and reconnect. I take it this isn't going to happen now, is it? No, I informed her. I have already completed the divorce papers. You won't do that, she said with a grin. First of all, you don't have the courage to divorce me. Secondly, I will bury you in divorce. I'll take everything you have, and who knows what Harry and his boys will do to you. Is this what you think? I asked. We'll see. I looked towards the front of the house and shouted, Okay, now you can go out. At that same moment, the door to my home office opened and five people came out. Emily looked up in surprise. Magnus walked up to Emily and looked down at her. Emily Sutton, he said, handing her a Manila envelope. You have been notified. I handed her a pen. If I were you, I would sign this now. So we can end this sham marriage, I said. I won't sign this, she said. I will fight with you every step of the way. It might be a little difficult, because the FBI will freeze your funds, I said. She looked at me in shock. FBI, she asked. I nodded my head. Yes, I told her. Meet Special Agent Peter and Agent Smith. They will take you into custody. I understand they have a warrant for your arrest, so sign the papers now. In 60 days it will all be over, and you can focus on your defense. I saw her deflate while I was talking. Trembling, she took the pen and signed the papers. Magnus witnessed her signature and affixed his notary seal, 
then took them back. I'll take this to Miss Davidson, he said. Two other people, Emily's parents, walked around to look at Emily. Her mother spoke first. Emily, I'm so ashamed of you, she said. How could you do this to William? I'm just following in your footsteps, Mom, Emily spat. Her father, and I looked at Emily's mother in shock. You're the one who told me that I should grab everything I can get. Is this true? Nancy asked her father. Terence. Nancy muttered something for several seconds, but did not say anything intelligible. We'll talk about this when we get home, Nancy, he told her. He looked at me before speaking again. I'm sorry about all this, William, he said. I had no idea. We have all of Emily's things, and she can come to our house for them whenever she can. Do us a favor and stay in touch, okay? Of course, Terence, I said, shaking his hand. Thank you. I watched them leave after the door closed behind them. Agent Peter spoke. Emily Sutton, you are under arrest on charges of conspiracy, racketeering, and physical involvement trafficking. Please stand up, turn around, and put your hands behind your back, he said. Emily followed his instructions and blared at me as Peter read her her rights. Once she was handcuffed, they dragged her outside. Magnus looked at me after they left. Everything went well, he said with a wry smile. Are you okay? Yes. Magnus, I'll be fine, I said. He nodded his head, then extended his hand. Take care of yourself, William, he said, as we shook hands. Six months later, the divorce went off without a hitch, thanks in large part to Harry's stellar work and the criminal charges against Emily. Federal authorities had arrested several people involved in Brust's operation, including Brust himself. After a couple of months of investigations, the trials began. Emily, considered a flight risk, was denied bail. The court provided her with enough funds for her defense, but by the end of the trial, she had spent more than three quarters of her savings. I spoke to her once after she was arrested. When the final divorce papers arrived, I visited her in the county jail where she was being held. They brought her out in shackles and tied her to the table opposite me. She looked like she had lost some weight and had dark bags under her eyes. You look like crap, Emily, I said. Yeah, well, orange isn't really my color, she shot back. What do you want? Still the same impudent cow as ever, I muttered. I was just curious to know if you've received the final divorce papers yet. I received them today, she said. You know, I had the opportunity to watch some of your videos, I told her. Did you like them? She asked with a grin. No, actually, I found them quite disgusting, I said. It doesn't matter, she shrugged. However, I was curious about something, I told her. I noticed that they all start the same way. A small homely guy is beaten, stripped, and tied to a chair with a chastity cage on it. Was this your idea? Actually, yes, it was, she said smugly. Was it supposed to represent me or something? Is this what you really wanted to do to me? Yes, it was my idea, she said. I thought about doing this to you several times. This was a long-time fantasy of mine, and I really enjoyed it. You're truly twisted, I said. You honestly didn't think I'd just sit back and let you do that to me, did you? I don't know, she said. Maybe. Well, it's a good thing you never attempted it, I said. I've never laid a hand on a woman, but if you had, I'd have been sorely tempted to end you. She stared at me in shock. I didn't wait for a response. I've heard tales about what you and Brust did to those girls, I said. How do you sleep at night? What? Shall I start crying? Apologize and beg for forgiveness, she spat. I shook my head. No, I'd expect that from a person, I said, or at least someone with a conscience, but we both know those terms don't apply to you, do they? You know, looking back, it's probably for the best you never had kids. You were a lousy wife, and you'd be a lousy mother. I thought I glimpsed a hint of sadness in her eyes, but truthfully, I didn't care, and I pressed on. Why don't you do us all a favor and end it? I asked. Her eyes widened. The world has enough problems. We certainly don't need you wasting air. I rose, preparing to leave. Oh my God, I turned you into a monster, didn't I? She asked. You really despise me, don't you? Did you piece all of this together on your own? 
Yes, I genuinely loathe you with every fiber of my being. Because of you, I doubt I'll ever love or trust another woman again. I hope it was worth it for you. Enjoy the rest of your sorry life. Goodbye. I turned and walked away. I thought I heard her sobbing, but I didn't care. I aimed to inflict pain with my words, and I hoped my message resonated with her. Not long after that final meeting, Emily cooperated with the state, divulging to federal authorities all the information they sought. In exchange, she pleaded guilty to lesser charges and received a five-year prison sentence. Magnus informed me that she would likely spend most of this time in isolation at an undisclosed location. Thanks to her testimony, Bruss was handed a 97-year prison term. The thought of him being dominated for the next century brought a smirk to my face. The rest of his team faced severe sentences. Terence and Nancy went through a rough patch, separating for a few months after a heated argument at my place. Though she swore she hadn't cheated, Terence found it hard to trust her. They nearly divorced but decided to attend counseling together. While they're still together, their relationship is strained. I moved forward, striving to rid Emily from my life. I sold my house and bought an apartment near my workplace. I hit the gym a few days a week to get back in shape and dated and even slept with a few women, but none resonated with me. I began therapy with Dr. Nelson, who's been instrumental in addressing my issues, but I know I have a long road ahead. Unless you've been through it, you can't grasp the pain of being betrayed by someone you loved and trusted for years as Emily betrayed me. However, things are looking up. I have my job, my new place, my freedom, and I've mentored some women at work taking interest in the new me. Yes, I'm still working on my problems, but who knows? Tomorrow's another day. Thanks for listening, like, share, and subscribe to the channel to listen to more stories like this.